Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethyst Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, Gender Identity Today. This content is brought to you by subscribers of Gender Identity Today. If you are already a subscriber, Thank you so much for your ongoing support, because subscribers not only receive new content directly to their inboxes as soon as it publishes, but are also able to interact with every contributor directly, and that includes me, which, you know, is like a perk, I think. So, if you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as other podcasts and other videos and written articles by our contributors, please consider subscribing using the links that you are going to find in the show notes. So today I am absolutely ecstatic to be speaking with my new friend, Sandrine Marois. Hi, Sandrine. Hi, very excited to be here too. Thank you. I can't tell you how excited I am to talk to you because Sandrine, we actually met, I put out just like this generic post on, I guess, Mastodon while I am blue sky asking for podcast guests and Sandrine responded and I looked at, at your website, Sandrine, and I see you are a poet. I'm going to rattle these all off. A poet, a photographer, a painter, a podcast, and an author of over 40 books. I mean, yeah. now I'm at 15, also... actually. 50, oh, 50. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> go, go, you got to have to, you're going to have to update your website now. So no, I did. I did. I updated like a couple of days ago. <laughs> oh, yeah. There you go. Um, <laughs> Sandrine is also co-founder of Aurora's and Blossoms, which is a cool community. I was looking at this, a cool community um, dedicated to creating and sharing art uh, that spans across the human spectrum. And, you know, that kind of fits into what I'm doing. I figured an artist this prolific and outreaching um, is the perfect guest for a discussion that I wanted to have about how art fits into the human experience and how it sort of fosters our understandings of our understanding of ourselves and other people. So I got to tell you with a body of work like this voluminous, I mean, what you had to have had this childhood that was just, I, I'm kid, let me just start over. Take us to the beginning. What was it that got you so inspired? How did you develop this much creativity? I wish I could tell you, honestly, it's just, it's just life. It's just life. Um, I'm someone who has had a connection with myself for many years and nothing in my childhood said, you're going to be an artist. Uh, really? Okay. My parents encouraged reading. So my mom, uh, was a math teacher in high school. Oh, gosh. And before I was done with kindergarten in France, uh, I knew how to read, to count, and how to write. Sure. Basically, that was it, because my mama taught me. And in France, in kindergarten, it's like, I don't know how it is in the U.S., but in Canada, just about a year. But in France, kindergarten is you start as early as two and a half years old. Oh, gosh. And you okay. go there for two, three years, four years, until you reach first grade. But during those first years, uh, you learn a few basics. And I, I think now they learn a second language as early as kindergarten. So when I started first grade, I knew how to read, how to count, and how to write. Um, this allowed me to take advantage of the huge library we had in our house. Uh, my mom and my dad read a lot and encouraged education. For them, education was a very important thing because my dad didn't go to school uh, for a long time. And out of my immediate family, my mom and my aunt, so my uh, my grandparents on my mother's side, um, they were the first one to go to university. So we come oh, from very poor stock. And, but my family has been an example of hard work for me. They instilled hard work and the importance of sure. education, of reading, and so on and so forth. But in terms of art... No one believed that there should be an artist anywhere in the family. I don't, I don't know if there is an artist in my family. So nothing said in my childhood, you're going to be an artist. Um, I distinctly remember, though, uh, I don't know which grade it was, but um, 
our teacher in that specific grade encouraged us to write poetry, to write short stories and asked us pretty much every week, who wrote a poem? Who wrote a short story? Who wants to read in front of everyone? And you got something like a gold star or your name was displayed on the wall, something like this. Sure. And I distinctly remembered writing a poem on a donkey, I think. The, the, the theme was a donkey. I don't know exactly what it was. But I remember the teacher saying, oh, this is this is very good but that that's all I remember <laughs> from my my childhood really and when I was a teenager you know teen hormones and stuff like that emotions did the guys and some sure. of the girls and whoever struck your fancy whatever you wanted to write about that person because I was not the popular kid so no one was in love with me and I was an only child I'm still an only child and you know, I wrote, but the stories and the poems were silly and didn't make sense. Um, and so the there was no real, there was nothing that really said Sondland is going to be an artist and going to start to write in her life. Nothing really. And, and it wasn't encouraged in my family. My family doesn't, still to this day, doesn't really care about what I do as an artist. It's really? not, it's not, and, and, and Anyway, you shouldn't accept that, uh, expect that from family members or, you know, that's not the way it works. Um, so, yeah, long story short, there's nothing in my childhood except um, this encouragement to read. And, and, and I remember coffee table books, uh, history, art, and stuff like that. So reading was really the thing that was encouraged because my parents sure. really wanted me to be educated, to be well-informed, and to be curious. They wanted me to be curious and ask questions, so on and so forth. But that's the extent, really, of the seeds behind, you know, my, my artistic garden, if I could put it that way. Sure. It's crazy to me, too, because it just, I mean, as you were telling the story, it struck me that... Um while many people value reading, we don't really value writing. Because, yes. I mean, what you did was make all of your own stories, your own poetry. Mm -hmm. But if you weren't encouraged to do that, because they could have read that. So if you prize reading, why would you not also prize reading stuff that you wrote? I don't know. I have no answer. I don't either. <laughs> but the thing I can say is my mother wrote beautifully. This oh, I know. Wow. She wrote beautifully, but uh, because she helped me with my essays and stuff mm -hmm. uh, when I was a kid, and she always helped me and always had a look to correct the mistakes and to proofread and everything. Uh, and she said, "No, you know what? This sentence, this is this is okay grammatically speaking. It's fine, but this is how you can improve, improve the sentence." So she was very. Um, anal, I should say about details. Sure. Yeah, yeah, but it gave me a good. Um, it really helped me understand the importance of working on details, of perfectionism taken to the right level. Sure. If it makes sense. It, it does. I want to ask you, let me ask you this question. I think it was Leonard Bernstein who said, I think it was Leonard Bernstein, it, mm -hmm. he was quoted as saying, what makes a great piece of music is a good idea in too little time. Yes. Or not enough time, I think is how yes. he says it. It's a great idea, not enough time to, to develop it. Yeah. I've ended up coming to that point, too, because it's like, well, I could, I could spend hours and hours and hours writing something that's 1,200 words yep. and trying to focus on every single word. And I've gotten to a point where I'm like, no, you know what I need is to get the timer out. Yeah, and absolutely. Go, <laughs> absolutely. When this dings, I'm finished. <laughs> I agree. I agree. It's a, it's an interesting, but I think the it, and things end up better for it because at the very beginning I would spend a whole day writing something, and now I spend more like three hours, mm -hmm. and I think it's a better. I think it ends up better personally, yeah. but. I think it depends on the way your brain functions. Mainly, I would say that not everyone works well under pressure. Others True. better than others. So I think it's, I would say, a case-per-case case basis, really. It's a yeah. good point. Yeah. Um, so, when, so now you've developed 
Let me again, got to count these. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So a total of seven, I'm holding up five fingers. Yeah, Pretend I, I held up seven, <laughs> all right? <laughs> Thank you. I tend to do that. I'll, yeah. I'll be making a video or something like three points I want to make. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nobody's four. watching. Four. It doesn't make it. <laughs> right. So for me, this is seven. I'm just going to run with it. Yeah. But you've made up seven, uh, yeah. you've developed seven different styles of poetry, all of it based around a haiku. Yeah. Right? Can, I mean, I mean, developing a whole new style, like that's really branching out. So starting writing poetry, you go, okay, well, that's something. Developing a new style, that that seems like sort of taking it to the next level. Um, <laughs> oh, sure, you shrug. Everybody who's super creative. Cause, so somebody says, hey, you're super creative, and they go, hey, I guess. <laughs> I think this desire to create the way I do and to do some kind of pioneering work in my okay. field uh, stems from a, a desire to challenge myself constantly. Sure. Uh, and I think not enough people do that <laughs> on a daily basis. Um, and, and, and a challenge doesn't have to be a big thing. It can be a small thing. Uh, you know, sure. and a challenge can be something if you're, if you struggle, if you struggle, for example, to go out because it's hard for you to socialize with people. Um, instead of staying home 24 seven, try to go out for five minutes. That's the kind of challenge I'm talking about right here. So everyone is different in terms of creativity. So for those, for you, maybe, you know, creating forms is, you know, big, for me, it's not because it's part of that challenge I gave myself from the beginning. And I remember that from being a teenager, even before I was uh, I was a writer, I remember wanting to challenge myself because I suffered from such debilitating depression in my life that I wanted to make sure that I was always active so I would use I my energy to focus on things that mattered and that helped my the kind of chemical imbalance that was going on to rebalance everything, if it makes sense, right? Yeah. So to each their own in terms of the kind of challenges they give themselves. But I believe that people would be a lot happier in life if they challenged themselves more often and with little things, not sure. Things. Yeah. There was, it was earlier on, it was before we started recording, you mentioned people feeling uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I mean, did, I mean, is that what you're talking about? Continually yeah. trying to feel, I guess, discomfort? Well, because if you don't feel discomfort in your life, how can you accept everyone? How can you accept yourself? Uh, if oh, something sure. bothers you, bothers you so much that you want to criticize or you want to throw shades at something, why don't you look into it? Don't you study it? No one is telling you to adopt a child. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. But, you know, why is something bothering me that much? Why is it? Why don't I ask questions and... and and I mean, you can make a mistake, but just go to someone, for example, who eludes you or you think you hate and say, OK, you know what? I have a question to ask you. If it's stupid, just let me know. But I just wanted to to warn you that my question may be ignorant. My question may be stupid, but I don't know. So I count on you to educate me. And I've never met someone who was disrespectful with me because I stated things that way. If sure. I approach someone who is different from me, and everyone is different from me anyway, if I approach them from a place of, I'm going to ask you my question. Yeah, if you disagree with it, it's your problem, not mine. But I want to ask you this question it might be stupid. It might be ignorant. I apologize in advance, but I need to ask it because I want to educate myself. The person will respond with love, with understanding, and with patience. Even if that person has had to explain the same thing over and over 50 times before you. Right. Agreed. Yeah. But if you can go... 
If you go into a conversation, let me see, I want to figure out how to back into mm-hmm. this. Most people don't want to go into a conversation saying, you know, I might look ignorant here. I mean, you don't, you're in Canada, I believe, right? Yep, absolutely. <clears throat> okay. So it, right now in the UK and in the US in particular, you know, there's a lot of people going, I'm going to say something totally stupid. And it is the, it is, you know, the truth, the truth, capital T, well, yeah. capital T, <laughs> capital yeah. the capital truth. And, and that I think is a, is one of our big problems is the, mm-hmm. the yeah. desire. Mm, I don't want to use desire. It's like discomfort in saying, I don't know something, you know, to, to bring it back around with discomfort. Yeah. But Absolutely. I mean, why is, I don't know why that's wrong to be able to say, listen, I don't know something. That's rhetorical. I know. I, I think people are scared of being wrong, because yeah. then, and it goes back to the the discussion about challenge. They don't challenge themselves enough. They don't okay. challenge their knowledge. Um, I I don't know how the way Socrates used to say it because I wasn't there, obviously. But I think he, the famous quote is, "Be of the world." I mean, what is it? Be of the world without being of the world, but seek the world. Something like this. I I can't remember what it is exactly. In 2024, we have no excuse to live in a bubble. Agreed. We have no excuse to say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm worried I will be wrong. Because if you go to people and tell them, you know, I'll probably be wrong, but I want you to educate me. Like... You have so much to gain and, and people won't be as aggressive as they are. Right. Because it's it's all in the way you say things. I mean, I have a strong voice when I speak. You know, people say, okay, I'm down. Are you, are you pissed? Are you annoyed? And I know, no, no, it's it's my voice. So people tend to think sometimes that I'm blunt and aggressive. I'm French, so I'll be blunt. It comes with the territory, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. But, but my voice is not something I can change. It's the way it is. So people often tell me, are you are you annoyed? Are you PMSing men? You know how they are. (laughs) So, but I'm like, no, this is my voice. Uh, But it doesn't mean that I have this voice that I am not understanding and that sometimes I'm wrong. I'm afraid of being wrong. So part of the discomfort, I think to me, and of course I could be wrong, but this is the way I see things. Because we don't challenge ourselves enough, we don't encourage others to challenge us, but in a loving way. So right. we live in a one-way street, basically. It's me or the highway. So kids are not used to being challenged anymore. We tell them everything you do is correct, you know, even if it's right. mediocre. It's, oh, yes, fantastic. No, I think if you go, go to it with love and understanding and compassion there's nothing wrong with telling people you know what i heard you but i believe that you were wrong for this reason and this reason and i'm going to explain to you why and maybe we'll come and maybe i'm wrong too but you know the more we talk about it the more there's a chance that we can actually change the status quo and And I believe people are wrong when they think they cannot do anything. If you educate one person and that person that then that person will educate someone else. Right. Oh, it's a whole ripple effect, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So so I I know one of your early you, you grew up loving to read, and I know one of your early I don't know if influence is the best word for her, but Jane Austen yeah. not I mean, not like transparent writing. I mean, fairly opaque writing. Is uh, mm. is that part of of her appeal to you? Is is the depth of thought? Depth of so- thought and and knowing because I studied. I'm a former English major, so in France mm. I studied English and depth, uh, linguistics, phonetics, did literature, history, and so on and so forth, and and. You know, we can criticize the education system as much as we want, but by learning to analyze texts, you know, and books, you know, I, I really got a a deep um, delve into, you know, literature and, and the minds of, of the greatest authors in history. 
what I love about Jane Austen is what is between the line, what is not yes. being said, which is why I write haiku and I, I wrote a play and I love all this. And to me, good fiction is fiction that lets you read between the lines and imagine right, right. what's actually happening. Um, and Jane Austen is, uh, first of all, a fantastic writer. So if you want to learn how to write well, read Jane Austen. Agreed. But it's really the ability that women had to write about truth when she lived on her own or with a family but never got married, never had kids and lived in a, very, in a bubble, basically, in a bubble. This ability to write with that kind of depth is something that fascinates me, uh, just like Emily Dickinson, if you think about it. Same, same deal. So two very different women, but if you read them both, you'll see the same. There's a common thread between them. It's the ability to write about things that they would have barely have access to because of the way they lived in a kind of sure. bubble. And this ability to write things the way they did, that, that, that fascinates me. Emily Dickinson is not a poet that I always understand because the message sometimes is quite obscure. But uh, I'm working on, on a project right now with someone else and I got to reread Emily Dickinson and I, I read some of the poems on my podcast as well. And I rediscovered a poem from her and I'm like, oh my goodness, I didn't get the meaning initially, but now I get it. And the punch in the guts that I got, like this is a good punch I'm talking about, a really good punch. Like when you drink good wine or good, you, you eat good food, it's like, oh my God, I feel so happy. It's like, it's, it's inside, it's, it's, it's in your mind. There's something happening in your brain, in your soul. You're like, oh, I feel I feel full of it. Um, and, and, you know, I'm like, oh, my God, this is so profound coming from a 20 or so year old or 30 year old writer. Oh, true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Can, you know, I want to. This is a dumb question. Maybe it's not. No, nope. but I'm going to throw it out because because like, I, I mean, I actually love Jane Austen, too. Actually, a quick question: What, like, who's what? What is your fav favorite book by Jane Austen? I honestly, I can't answer. Right. <laughs> Don't have any. There, I find them all, all so similar, but at the same time, all so different. Right. Right. So. Because I translated two chapters of Pride and Prejudice for my thesis mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I took my BA uh, in English to French translation. So I, my subject for my thesis was Pride and Prejudice. Okay. So part of my thesis was to translate uh, two chapters of the book. Um, and... When you're a translator and when you work on the linguistic part of a book, uh, as a linguist, you pay attention to such details compared to someone who would just write for the sake of writing, who may not have studied right. grammar and so on and so forth. Sure. So Pride and Prejudice, because I translated it, part of it, I should say not everything, but those two chapters, that gave me a unique insight um, into the way she worked with the language. I and, see. Yeah. And, and, and I think what I find fascinating as well is a good writer will pick a word very carefully. Every word on a page is right. picked carefully. Uh, why would I say conversation instead of discussion, for example? Or what would I use the instead of a? Uh? Um, you know, um, and because English is not my mother tongue, French is my mother tongue, um, and English is so influenced by French. Of course. Uh, sometimes people tell me, oh, you, you, you write a little bit like people in the old days, like classic authors. Because I have this mixture as well, and I've read many, many, many of the classics in English and in French, so it has influenced the way I write as well. 
So every time I read a book, so Jane Austen, um, any even indie authors to this day, I I pay attention to that side of the writing that others may not pay attention to. And when I say this author is fantastic, is because I can tell that the author pays attention to everything they write on the page. Yes. I do the same, though. I think that's so important. Sometimes mm-hmm. I will look at a sentence and go, it is just a beautiful sentence. I mean, it's not. it doesn't even have to be an important sentence to the story, but sometimes I'll go, wow. But, you know, I've actually been accused of that, too. Some people have said um, that I'm kind of dense or... <laughs> I was going to say my right. They mean my intense. writing is dense, intense, but maybe? come to think of this, man. Intense. Wait. Intense. No dense. Actually, yeah. I've been called dense. That my writing's a bit dense. Yeah. I mean, I'm pres- presumably writing, uh, but they could have just been talking about me. Um, but because because I use phrases like sometimes I'll have like this forty word long sentence because it makes sense and, and it's mm-hmm. necessary yeah. to convey the point that I that I intend to convey. So. Where was I going with that? Oh, it was one of the, sorry, back to Jane Austen. No, it's good. Yeah, I love, uh, you know, her her style. Because if I were going to pick a favorite, I think I would go with Emma. Because mm. mm-hmm. I love the character. Emma yeah. is so naive. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting how everybody around her, you can see, you can read, I guess. You can, you can tell that these people are starting to, get in on it and go, wait a minute, what's wrong with Emma? And then, and she's just going, yeah, "Yeah, what's wrong? (laughs) And it's, I love that. I love how the character is portrayed. And I don't know if I always kind of loved like sort of naive characters anyway, but it's that portrayal that, that gets me. And I guess what really gets me, oh, I can't, what's her friend's name? Shoot. What's the Irish girl's name? I'm terrible with names. Okay, good. I'm glad, I'm glad you didn't just rattle it off. But her friend that she wants to set up with the other guy, doing great <laughs> at this one. I can't remember any character, but... <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. That girl's supposed to be the, the naive one, and that's what's such a great, you know, sort of foil for, for Emma's, you know, learning about herself. Anyway, that was a way big tangent. Sorry to go off on that, but... Mm-hmm. Um, but you've also, so you also mentioned like Shakespeare is another one. Emily Dickinson's a great one. Oh gosh, I never asked my question. Sorry, here's my oh, question. There you go. <laughs> I know, it wasn't even just what's your favorite book? Because the, like you can do, you can do very detailed writing. Because I was thinking of somebody like a Thoreau. That you read that and you just go every, you know, he's like, oh, I watched a leaf fall and it fell for 32.8 seconds and it kept on falling. And then I saw, yeah. and then a wind came by and then it moved it about four feet over. Yeah. And you just go, all right, great, man. Like leave a little bit more to the imagination. Yeah. Um, yeah. That ended up not being a question. What, what, <laughs> what, I love this right? interview. I love this interview. It goes all right, over the place. To, I love it. <laughs> Fantastic. It's so me. <laughs> Going to have to edit about three quarters of it out. Um, what do you, so what, if you were to compare the two, like how, how do you see that? Because, I mean, that's that's the way I see sort of a throw versus an Austin. Do you, I mean, yeah, I'm going to stop talking. I'm trying to think about a an answer that everyone can understand because in my brain I have the answer, but <laughs> it, it might be hard for me to explain it. And it's not because English is not my mother tongue. It's just because that's the way I roll in general. My brain is not very uh, ruly. It's unruly at times. Um, I, I make a huge difference between the classics and modern literature, contemporary literature. Sure. Sure. Um, uh, for me, the classics, whatever goes into the, the classic uh, folder um, is uh, people who have obviously mastered their craft. And whether we like them or not is irrelevant to the question. There's something about the way they write about their stories that withstands the test of time. I know I created, with my friend David Ellis, we created the Hemingway. Uh, based on Hemingway's six-word six stories, blah, blah, blah. Yes. 
but I cannot stand Hemingway. I cannot stand him. His style, and I was discussing this with a friend the other day over the phone. Uh, we were talking about how the French translations of his books read better. The translators do a better job really? of you know, translating his work. And in French, it flows so much better than it would in English. So Hemingway can be thankful to the translators in French. <laughs> Really, that's what it is. I cannot stand Hemingway. His style, you know, it's terrible. But who am I to judge? There is something in the stories that appeals to so many people that it became a classic. Sure. So I have no issue with Hemingway or whoever. I hate Fifty Shades of Grey. I think it's terrible. But you know what? It has appealed to so many people. And just for that... Unfortunately, one day we'll be in the classic folder. Unfortunately. But that's just my opinion. It doesn't matter what I think. But to me, the difference between good and bad writing, and once again, this is just my personal opinion. Um, it doesn't, I don't want it to stand as absolute truth because that's no, what it is. Take a stand. I want to know. Okay. I want to know the song. Opinion. Do it. No. Oh. Uh, Please. Um, for me, the major issue we have these days with contemporary literature is that many authors do not read the classics to oh, understand sure. what makes a good story, because they do not show enough. And you were talking about Thoreau. That's the point I'm trying to make. <laughs> You tell us too much. You don't show us enough. Yes, and right. When authors come to me, beginners tell me, oh, how can I write impactful stories? I, say, I always say, it doesn't matter how good you are at description. It doesn't matter how talented you are. If you do not know how to write a haiku or a play, your stories will fall flat. Wow. Why am I saying this? Uh, because the essence of a good haiku, the essence of a good play, is what you left between the lines for the reader to figure out. I Instead see. of telling us, oh, you know, that person killed herself on the train, blah, blah, blah. The way you set up everything is that you leave clues here and there so that throughout the story, the reader can determine, oh, now I figured out that person died on the train at such and such time. Maybe that's the reason why this and this is happening. So you can build your climax and have your twist and so on and so forth. And I'm saying this because I'm terrible at descriptions. I cannot write <laughs> descriptions. And people would say, oh, it's because English is not your mother tongue. You know, I'm terrible at descriptions. Point. Period. You know, end of conversation. So I found, <laughs> and, in, and in a way, it's not an issue. It's really not an issue. You know, there are other w ways you can counteract that lack of ability in writing description to write something else in a different way. So... No matter what you end up doing, whether you want to focus on descriptions or not, it doesn't matter. But if you don't know how to write a good haiku or you don't know how to write a good play, you will have issues understanding how to write a good story. I see. That, that. So that's the difference I make between the old days when, you know, Jane Austen, the long descriptions. I mean, we in French, we have tons of authors who are famous. Balzac, for example. Hugo. Long descriptions. You would fall asleep. You could skip 20 no. pages and still follow the story. Nothing would have happened. It was just, you know, there are others. But they have a way of writing that is so beautiful that mm -hmm. you're like, okay, I'm going to skip the pages, but I'm going to go back to those pages when I feel like it because it's still beautiful right. and I still want to read it. And that's the reason why they're classics. That's the only yes. reason. But the problem I have these days is that not enough authors, you know, are know the rules before they try to break them. I see. I see. And I don't know if I answered your question, actually. 
It was good enough. I, now it's telling me I got to go write more haiku. That's the <laughs> that's the main thing that I'm pulling from it. <clears throat> Do you know the man who laughs, Victor Hugo? That's one of my favorite, my favorite books of kind of all time. Um, I don't know. It's the story. Mm-hmm. There's I know there's like one chapter in it. I think it's I think it's in that one where he talks about like a convent. There's a whole chapter about this convent, and you kind of go. Where the hell is he going with this? You know, and I know like Les Miserables has a, a story, forgive my pronunciation, has like a story about, oh no, I'm sorry, it was Hunchback, has like a, a chapter about yeah. French architecture and you go, what the hell, where the hell is he going with this? Yeah. And the thing is, it was like nowhere. Yeah. I'm not going to go anywhere with it. I'm just going to write you a big descriptive chapter and you're going to go, yeah, thanks. <laughs> and like you said, you could skip 60 pages, a good 60 pages Absolutely. and come back in and go, yeah, I missed nothing. But then you can go back and look at just the beauty of, yeah. like, the lyrical essence of the of the the descriptions, mm. the uh, structure of the sentences. Okay. And I know we wrote in French, and I've only read translations. But, um, yeah, boy, do, I mean, you mentioned Victor Hugo. <laughs> do you do you not like him, or no? Did it, you not it, like him? It has nothing to do with that, but it's just the long okay. descriptions. It's just the long descriptions. But Hugo, like his books, are classics because obviously the stories appeal to readers. Yes. Have appealed to readers yes. for so, and it's Paris too. So I mean, really, everyone fantasizes over Paris, like of course, yeah. So, <laughs> but I have no problem with that. Whether I like something or not. You know, my opinion doesn't matter. It's just the way I like my okay. stories. And But I think authors, honestly, should stop skipping on steps, skipping steps. They should say, okay, I'm going to sure. read classics. And the authors who tell me, oh, I don't read. I'm like, okay, oh. So I tell yeah. them, so you would go see a doctor. You would need surgery. And the doctor would tell you, okay, you know what? I've never opened a the health book. I don't know anything. I'm just going to operate on you. This is an extreme example, but it, it hammers the point. Because they're like, oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, I said, yeah, you specialize right. in words. You specialize. So you need a little bit of knowledge right here. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to slap words here and there and, and write a story. Every Everyone is going to say, oh, yeah, this is fantastic. This is unfortunately not the way it works. Right. I want to... I think this is a great point that I want to I want to follow up because you just finished you just finished your big multimedia project. That's the homes we seek. Yes. And this is a combination of photography yeah. and poetry. Yeah. And I'm I'm curious, like, how do you with photography in particular, uh-huh. how do you read between those lines? I mean, how do you. Let me stop. I'm no, just it's add a the great question, question. Mark and... No, it's a fantastic question because no one has ever asked me this before. <laughs> oh, good. No, this is great. You read, for me, uh, of course I take photos of landscapes and architecture, but I like to focus on the little things that people forget to look at. And that's where the stories come in. That's yeah. where, because when you look, you know, what's the point of taking a photo of a leaf? And the shadow, you know, on, 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 on the ground. But then people look at look at the photo and like, oh, I'd never looked at things that way. And I'm interested in people. You see people looking. So when I take my photos, of course, in public, <laughs> why would I? Why would I not? So I'm a nature <laughs> photographer. So obviously people, you know, walk in the middle of what I'm doing. And people sometimes stop, stop. And look at like, what are you doing? What photos are you taking? So I show them and they're like, oh, wow, I never paid attention to this. And you see them after when they leave me, they're like looking, looking down, up and stuff. And they start yeah. being interested in things like that. So that that's basically what the reading between the lines happens for me, for photography. I get that. You, you mentioned a shadow. What about uh, what other things? I mean, because shadows, when you look at shadows of like leaves, mm-hmm. you know, so sun sun shining through some leaves, especially during ecl- an eclipse, by the way, that is so, so fascinating. But I think that is such a study in light and motion and 
I was hoping for a third word, but I didn't come up with one, so okay. I'll move on. But so so shadows, I get. What what other things do you would you focus on? Moments, uh, for example, um, one of the greatest photos I've ever taken was when I was in Syria. I, w I, I went to Syria uh, in 2009, so it was mm. before the Civil War started. So I'm extremely lucky because this, this is probably one of the best, the most beautiful countries I've ever visited. Okay. Um, and uh, um, you remember the arch that was destroyed in Palmyra, right, by ISIS. Mm -hmm. And so we were in the old part of the city. Um, and I had my old point and shoot camera at the time. I didn't know what I was doing. I wasn't a photographer then. Um, but you know, I was taking photos just for the sake of it. Um, and we were walking, um, and all of a sudden we hear people calling our names because people, many people are poor over there. So they're trying to sell you trinkets and stuff. They, sure. you know, calling you, blah, blah, blah. And we're walking, I still remember, I'm closing my eyes so I can describe it better. So we're walking, the group and I are walking and we hear those people behind us. Um, and I turn around and I saw these people uh, trying to reach us, running towards us and walking. They were a kid. They were um, um, an adult on what you call a drom dromedary. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, camel. Camel. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Camel. So this guy was on a camel. They were trying to catch up with us, basically. And so I'm like, sure. oh, my freaking God, I have to take this photo. So I just shot the photo. It was sure. so candid. And to this day, this is my best photo. People see this photo, they're like, oh, I, I've seen this photo. And magazines, I've tried to buy the rights for this photo because it has the arch. So it's, sure. historically speaking, it's very relevant. And it's such a candid photo. No one posts for the photo and so on and so forth. So to make my point, <laughs> this is... This is the kind of photos I'm looking for. Uh, the things that most of us don't think about. And I, here I am with my camera yeah. and people look at me like, well, you're taking photos of the sun behind the leaves and the shadow, blah, blah, blah. And they look at it. <gasps> yes. Oh, wow. And, and adding words to the photos helps um, cement the stories as well. Because I tend to use haiku uh, for those uh, for those photos as well, uh, so I, I tend to try and redirect the eyes basically, not just with my camera, but with my words as well. So people can finally realize, oh yes, I don't need to travel to the end of the world to take a photo. I can go to my backyard and mm -hmm. actually photograph grass. And I spent two years in a row. Uh, in the summer uh, and spraying with a little bit of water so that he had drops taking shots of grass in my backyard like lying down on my stomach and taking photos with the dogs <laughs> trying to lick <laughs> me and try. but you know what that's what I love about photography about art in general it's like People will criticize you all say, oh, you could have taken the photo differently. You could have painted differently, light and shadow. You don't know composition. You don't know this. You don't know that. But at the end of the day, if when you take your shot or you paint your image or whatever you do, if you have this hit in your gut that says you have something, then you have great art. That's your reaction uh, the joy you feel, or it could be the sadness you feel, it doesn't matter. Like, if you feel strong emotion that lifts you up, or unfortunately take you down sometimes because that's the way it happens, sure. it doesn't matter. But if you feel something very different in your brain, happening in your brain, happening in your heart, you know, your heart beats faster, you feel your soul is connected, you feel like different emotions from what you usually ex uh, experience, 
then this is great art because you know your audience will feel something. They will not necessarily say, oh, I understand the message. I can actually pinpoint exactly what the person is trying to say, but they will feel something too. Definitely experience something. And that's the journey as an artist I want to take uh, people on. And, sure. and now this book is, is out of, out of print, but I had a book for several years, um, short poetry for those who feel, who, who fear death. Uh, so it was basically, um, short poems, um, basically teaching you in my own way, how to grieve better because death sure. is such a difficult topic. And, uh, when my mom passed away, uh, she committed suicide after many attempts. Um, and the second last attempt, I'm like, I have to prepare myself. I have to be prepared mentally. Uh, not that you can always prepare yourself, <laughs> but if you start grieving when you know someone is going to leave, no matter what happens, no matter how hard you try, the person is going to leave the plane. You know, they're gone. So, I've, I've found that preparing myself mentally, psychologically for that upcoming loss helps you grieve a lot healthier. Faster, not so sure, but healthier. Meaning that there will be a hole in your heart your whole life. But the way you deal with a hole is a lot healthier. Makes you feel, your life goes on a lot faster. So when my mom finally died after so many attempts i'm like oh yeah this so i was right to prepare myself because the the grieving process was so healthy uh which is why i'm able to talk about it the way i am right now sure but i'm like i know people suffer from it it's important to talk about it so i wrote that book and i didn't care how many people would read it I don't know. So I think the book honestly uh, sold five copies, <laughs> to be honest with that. But out of these five copies, um, one person emailed me and basically said, before reading your book, I wanted to die. I've read your book Ooh. and I want to live. Wow. That's what I'm talking about. This is art right here. That is art. So this response this visceral this visceral response this visceral hmm i don't have a good word i'm just gonna say yes mm -hmm. you know sort yep. of a yes to it mm -hmm. um is it because of the the stories between the lines that we have less of a response when we get told too much if if we get to fill in the lines is is that yes more more? That's a very interesting question, yes. Um, I think that's because you allow people to process the information in their own way. You don't tell them, this is the way you should react. You allow them to react at their own pace and the way they want. Because if they miss a clue and then, you know, the answer happens later with the twist and so on and so forth, they're like, oh, I didn't get that. And they go back maybe to that passage that they missed sure but you you don't impose yourself on them you allow them to have the space to uh process you know the emotions and the information that they're given in their own terms if it makes sense it does and i think because ultimately the question i wanted to ask and, and you've answered it was what is what does art end up teaching us about ourselves? Mm -hmm. And that story in between, that, that you know, story between the lines, I said it poorly, sorry. The story between the lines, when we make that up, that's what we, that's what we learn about ourselves. And I don't mean to say make that up. You know, when we feel it, when we see it, when we synthesize it, there we go. That's the word I want to use. Yeah. When we synthesize it, that's really the lesson we get from from great art. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Because our reactions to things are tainted, no, I shouldn't say tainted, by, but influenced by our surroundings and the way we process 
our own emotions, the way we were raised. Um, right. So I think that's why it's so important to leave so much between the lines because I think many authors, and at least it's true for me, we write from a place of experience. Whatever you find sure. in my books is based on my personal experience. And if it's not my personal experience per se, it stems from many conversations I've had with people and the, the message I heard from them. Um, and that's why I write, basically. That's why I do art, because I right. want to share the lessons I've learned in life. Uh, and you can do that with anything. But you have to be willing to open yourself to it, to the experience. Yes. Yeah. That ends up... Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'm, this is, I'm like I'm having these revelations, like these <laughs> flashbulbs going up. I don't think we still have flashbulbs. Because this is really the great lesson of life. Mm -hmm. So we live in this, yeah. in this, you know, land of information, land. No, we live in this you know, life of information overload. Yeah. And we keep on hearing more and more and more and more and more. But what we don't see is why all this information is coming at us, where the, you know, yeah. what's behind it, I guess. I, I, I can leave it at that. But that's, um, that is a fascinating, I mean, I cannot tell you what, what a great, what a great what a great piece of knowledge. Um, can I get, there's one last topic <laughs> that I had no intent of talking about. <laughs> but at the beginning, before we hit record, because you always do that, right? You know, you hit, you hit record and you go, gosh, I wish we'd have recorded that last bit. Um, <laughs> but now that we've talked for, for 50 some odd minutes, you and I were talking about, in particular, the... Um, integration of the lgbtq mm -hmm. community back into the the rest you know the whole of the world mm -hmm. that that ultimately you know we have just the world not our community yeah. and then the rest of the you know the rest of the world there's only one how do we how do we do that how is the how is that and i want to i want to bring it back to the idea of the stories between because i think the rest of the world what they miss in in our community, and forgive me, I did not say anything about you are part of this community. And no, 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 give, no, give no, 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 I I totally get it, yeah. No. So, so what, what, I mean, I, I think that that ends up being the story between, the story between the lines that the rest of the world sort of misses, that, that those of us in the, in the LGBTQ yeah. community do see yeah. in terms of sexuality or gender mm -hmm. or whatever. How do we, how do we, how? It's a very difficult question <laughs> without being a political, unfortunately. But I of course. think uh, I think we speak too much with our traumas. We let our traumas, you know, lead the way, basically. And we react to people. We treat them the way we used to be treated. Sure. I do understand in some situations, the trauma is so huge and so yes. deep that we don't know we do it. But in some cases, I believe that some people are so angry that they refuse to be open to... Yes, trauma is actually speaking for me right here. It's just the same as imposter syndrome in the writing community or artistic community. Yeah. We're so full of it in every sense of the term. <laughs> and the ego as well. We don't keep our egos on in check, I've noticed. Uh, and... The reason why I was telling you before recorded that I don't feel included in the LGBTQ plus community 
is because I don't feel, I do not feel that my experience counts as a lesbian. Counts? Yeah. I don't feel because my experience is so different from what you see in the media, whatever the most vocal, okay. the most vocal representatives um, are trying to sell. I shouldn't sure. say sell, but I'm trying to share with the world that people like me end up being left on the sidelines because my the trauma I experienced is not enough, if it makes sense. That's what I'm trying to say. I was going to ask if that's what you were going to say. <laughs> I was trying to choose my words carefully. But that's, I mean, I so understand that. There's, I so understand that. I feel like we could probably talk another yeah. two and a half years just on that topic ten. Of, of... Ten years. Ten years. Ten. Ten, ten years. <laughs> Perfect. Ten. <laughs> well, if you hold up your five fingers and I hold up mine, we've got ten. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't know how I'm going to end up putting these two together, but... No. Um, it's a great point, though, because I, you know, trauma does end up speaking for us. Or, yes, no, that's a good way to say it. The trauma does end up speaking for us, and I, it's funny because I, you know, there are people who have said to me, "Gosh, you have a really traumatic story," and I kind of go, "I mean, I guess," but you know, like I don't, like I don't want to. My trauma ends up not being me. Mm -hmm. My exactly. my story is greater than that. Absolutely. And, and so when I've heard people say that, I go, well, yeah, but look at yourself. I mean, look at what you had to deal with, too. I may mean, have a friend in particular, if she's listening, she's going to know I'm talking about her, who consistently says, God, I had a great upbringing, good childhood, mm -hmm. you know, great adulthood, got kids, whatever. I don't really feel like I'm part of the community because I didn't have enough trauma. I didn't, I didn't hurt enough yeah. to Absolutely. get to where I am. Absolutely. And that's... I. I mean, I think that's sad. I think that's a bummer. I mean, why would yeah. we, why would we do that yeah. to ourselves? I don't know. I guess is is what I'd say. Because I mean, the representation is getting a lot better in the media and the mm. shows. I mean, I watch a lot of shows and I see, and I remember being glued to my TV when Buffy was on, and finally we got our first lesbian couple. And I'm like. <gasps> Thank God I was in my early 20s. Sure. I'm like, oh my God, I've never seen this before. And then they kill Tara, whatever whatever name she has, like three episodes later. And I'm crying. I'm crying. I'm crying. So there's been a lot of improvement for all of us. The representation yes. is st much, much better than it used to be. And when kids complain these days, I'm like, yeah, well, try living in the 1990s or 1980s. Because I can tell sure. you... Where I used to live, there was a tag on, my, on the wall in my neighborhood that said something like this. Gay people, we know who you are, we'll find you. And that tag was left on the wall for many, many years. Wow. I grew up with that tag near my home. So can you imagine growing up, well, you know, I don't know if it was bisexual, or lesbian, I didn't know at the time. I knew there was something going on. But... Seeing this tag every time I went back from school on that wall. So just yeah. imagine growing up in that kind of environment in the 1980s or 1990s. So, yes, there's still a lot of work to do. Let's not kid ourselves. Like, But Clearly. there's so much improvement. And I'm glad to see so many people coming out and, you know, talking about it. But all the stories I see... Uh, even in the media, in movies, in in shows, it's kind of the same people. Men and women kind of look um, the same. Men are all like girly and stuff like that when there are very right. macho men who are gay. <laughs> And there's right. nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with being girly or macho. It doesn't really matter. But all these cliches. We don't realize how much these cliches influence the way we're going to come out, we're going right. to accept ourselves. And 
And then people are like, oh, how should I come out? Should I have a party? Should I do this like I saw in this show? I'm like, no. When I came out, it was like I was on the phone 10,000 kilometers away saying, you know why I moved to Canada? P part of the reason I moved to Canada is, it's not everything, but part of the reason is I had met someone and that was it. So I'm like, this is why I moved. And people were like, okay, fine. That's how it came out. It was anticlimactic, as anticlimactic as you can dream it. And all my friends as were like, be. who cares? Yeah. But I was lucky because it could have been worse. People could have said, oh, you know, I'm going to, because I had a few, like, not friends, but acquaintances who didn't really sure. agree. Uh, men and women alike, it doesn't really matter. So I was lucky. But it was still my experience, and I still walk on eggshells even today because you're not going to say yeah. I'm gay to everyone because you still don't know how they're going to react. And all these exactly. cliches and all these cliches and you see in movies and shows, despite the huge improvement in representation, they're still cliches. Um, so you don't know how who watches those shows, what people think. And you could still find yourself in a ditch one day because you meet someone who disagrees with your lifestyle. So right. that's why you said it much better than me in terms of the trauma, the representation, because if, yeah, if, because my trauma is not big enough to make the news and my coming out party is, was not big enough to make the news. So people still think, oh, you still don't know who you are. So I'm like, well, I'm happily married. Right. I've been with the same person for decades. So nothing will change for me, but I don't need a big right. announcement. But at the same time, I would like to say, yeah, I'm part. I, I feel comfortable being part of the LGBTQ plus community, but at the same time, sometimes I'm told that it's not enough. That I need to do more. But it's not the end of the world. I mean, I'm happy, and it doesn't. <laughs> at the end of the day, whatever works for you. I don't need to belong to community to exist. Sure. Uh, but I hope I answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. Oh my gosh, absolutely. No, I, I mean, because I agree at the end of the day, like the label, like, okay, I mean, I've got a label. Fantastic. Yeah. Does that make me any different? You know, whether I call myself transgender, if I call myself something else, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, if I were going to try to sum, sum that up, and it's not like this is a common thing I do, but I, but I'm still loving this idea of the stories between the lines because I kind of feel like the trauma that that's portrayed, those are the lines. And, and what we need to show between the lines is the life, well, outside the trauma. Because we... Because we, we, we what do we want in life, really? What's the big point we want with transgendered, you know, cisgendered, whatever we are, what do we want is to be happy. Just to be happy. Right. My story, your story, is just as valid as anyone else's, just because it might not be the cliche that we were expecting, doesn't make it more valid than other stories. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> when we decide we're we come out for any reason, uh, none of us said, oh yeah, I didn't think about it. You know, I just decided to, oh, let's let's improvise the coming out. Sure. The, the big story is that we thought about it for years. It's sometimes oh for gosh, decades. When we yes. come out, it's not like we blurt it out. Okay, I'm gay, I'm transgender, blah, blah, blah. But people are, oh, that's okay. Why didn't you tell me earlier? Uh, because maybe you could have beaten me up or you could have talked to all your right. friends. Uh, right. that's why. So that's why it took me so long to actually talk to you because deep inside, maybe I went through depression. Maybe I went through years of doubts. I didn't know who I was. I didn't accept myself. So if I tell you now, it's because I accept myself. Yes. So. Yes. Gosh, almost like saying, if you speak from trauma, there is, I mean, and this is not to diminish those stories. No, absolutely. Although not. if you, if you're speaking from trauma, there's, there may be an element of, of still not completely accepting yourself. And, and, and none of us really deserves to live like that, in oh, my opinion. Absolutely. You know, each absolutely. of us certainly should be able to oh, I agree. accept ourselves. Absolutely. Well, 
<laughs> Sandrine, now, you know, we've been talking for too long. <laughs> Not too long, but we've been talking, you know, long. Yep. we're out of time, I'll go with that. <laughs> I was having a hard time. Like, how do I say it to go, okay, I need to shut you down now. <laughs> oh, it's not. It, not wasn't, no, it was, honestly, I have to tell you, this was fantastic. I've never Thank had you. this conversation with anyone on a podcast before. So well, thank you. Thank you very much. That's, I, you know, you, you have a lot of gratitude from me because this is, this is a dream interview for me, really. Being oh, able, because we talked about art, we talked about writing, but I, I talk about it all the time, like on podcasts and interviews. So uh, this was an absolute breath of fresh air, really. Thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, I don't know. Everything I, I see and read and hear from you, I just go, what a, what a just a beautiful person. Thank you. But you are, you are too. Like, and I told you I love your hair. So it's part of the magic of, you know, when, when, like, beautiful, I'm not going to say beautiful people, but when when people who have lived, have experienced things, who have learned, meet, usually you have those conversations. Right, right. Publicly like this on a podcast, that's a different story. Right, less so, but... Um, and oh gosh, no, <laughs> I'm going to turn off the recording and then we're going to talk for another hour and a half. That's <laughs> no, I'm, I'm all good. I'm all good. <laughs> good one. No, I'm uh, having a blast. So <laughs> whatever. Good. Works, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, then I will say thank you to both of our, to all, all, thank you to both of our listeners. There's only two of them out there. Sorry, Sandrine. <laughs> <laughs> what a way to end <laughs> the conversation. I love it. <laughs> I appreciate you both. Jim and Judy, appreciate you listening. Thank you. Thank both you, of guys. You. Thank you to our listeners, and thank you to Sandrine Marois. Um, I am Amethyst Herrick. This is Gender Identity Weekly. We were talking about art and expressing yourself and the stories that, that live between the lines. Thank you. Thank you very much.